All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of uh, Saber Sims Strategy Sessions. Here, uh, I'm joined by Matt and Will today. We're going to be talking a little bit about our baseball model. Uh, really kicking into full gear here in the baseball season as we're getting into the the heat of the summer. So I know there's been a lot of questions, uh, a lot of interest on the baseball side of things lately, especially as it relates to the model. So um, wanted to put this together for you guys to talk about a little bit, but. Uh, if you're new to these strategy sessions, uh, we host these live every Thursday here at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we are doing these live for a reason. So uh, we want engagement from you guys. We want questions. Uh, if we say something that's kind of confusing or you're not totally clear on or you just have something to add to the conversation, throw it into YouTube chat or throw it into our Office Hours channel on Slack, uh, and we will get right to it. So um, without much further ado here, I know we got a lot to talk about, but uh, Matt, Will, how are you guys? Doing good. Yeah, doing, doing pretty good. Good. Right on. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and just let this get kicked off here, Matt. Uh, do you want to just kind of start with maybe a, a high level of, of how our model works and how our simulator is working for baseball? Yeah, for sure. So uh, kind of a background, basically, uh, you know, I built Saber Sim with uh, just baseball. So that was like uh, 2015, I think. I started like writing a baseball simulator. Um, so like baseball is kind of our home base. Like I've always considered that like my baby with Saber Sim. And I think we've gotten really strong in a lot of the other models, but um, it's exciting to talk about MLB right now because that's like where it started. And I think we have a really strong model and even stronger now, but yeah, basically how it works for those, especially for those that are new to Saber Sim, um, that Sim part of Saber Sim is not just the name. Um, we, we actually simulate all of the games for the day um, thousands of times. And um, the way that we do that is we basically analyze the past like 10 years of play-by-play -play data from the MLB, from AAA, AA, all the minor leagues. Um, we analyze all of that data and we, we kind of put it into this uh, really complex model that takes all the factors from uh, ballpark to umpire to batter and pitcher to all this other stuff. Um, and we come up with basically probabilities for all these different factors that go into the game. And we have all these probabilities for the factors and then we plug that into the simulator. And so we say, um, let's simulate this game play by play thousands of times. So we're not just doing this like theoretical sim, we're actually like simulating the game. We'll take these probabilities and we'll say, all right, let's choose a random event based on these probabilities. It's gonna be a single. Now there's a guy in first, let's do the next play. And so. Um, we're really getting, you know, the most accurate uh, results possible, and in terms of not only the average projection but the full distribution of events. So, so yeah, we analyze all that play by play. We simulate the games, and then the result, the projections that you see on Saber Sim are basically just the average of all of those simulations. But when you run builds, it, um, you know, it, it takes into account all of the distributions, all of the different um, results that can happen in the simulation. So we're not just looking at the mean projection. Um, when you're running lineups, you're looking at all of the different uh, simulated outcomes. Right, yeah, and I think that's that's part of really is what is so powerful here. And we, we talk a lot on Office Hours about um, looking at some of those ranges of outcomes when you click, click the player name. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we leverage those using smart diversity for, for people that maybe aren't so familiar? Yeah, for sure. So basically how smart diversity and how the builder works is we essentially bin the simulation. So we, we kind of group them. Um, randomly so we're taking like random samples of different groups of simulations and how big those groups or bins are changes based on the smart diversity setting so uh, a simple way of explaining it is when you have smart diversity all the way at zero then every lineup is using the full range of simulations um to to build a, an individual lineup so we're just taking the average of all the sims which is just the same as the projection when you have smart diversity at the very other end, at, at 10, at the maximum setting, then every single lineup is looking at one simulation. So uh, those are like the range, the ranges of that setting. And that's obviously a huge range because one of them is just taking the 
average. That's just the mean projection. The other one is taking every single lineup is looking at one simulation. And so um, in that sense, when you run a build with like maximum smart diversity, what you're doing is saying, give me the optimal lineup from, you know, however many 1500 different simulations of this slate. Um, and, and that's a really cool way of thinking about it because especially for something like showdown or small slates where you really need to get the optimal in order to win in order to get first, that's what you want to do. It's like, you're saying, I want the optimal lineup in a particular, um, outcome of these games. Um, all those middle values are, uh, between zero and 10 or between, you know, one and nine for smart diversity are just different ways of, uh, adding like a smart, that's what we call it, smart diversity. It's adding like this smart randomness where it's not just random variance between lineups. It's actually like the true variance of the players. And that variance is also correlated so that um, if you're taking bins of like, say five simulations at a time, you know, if in those five simulations, the Yankees score an average of 10 runs, um, then all of the Yankees are going to have higher point values in those sims. So we're the only... Uh, builder that does this where we our randomness is correlated and it's using like real distributions not just um random you know just like a random uh integer added or a normal distribution it's like the true distribution of outcomes so that's how like our lineup builder really leverages the simulator to to kind of create lineups in a way that no one else does right Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, it's obvious that it's a, it's a big advantage to actually look at real um, possible outcomes instead of applying this randomness to, to your projections. Um, yeah. I think it, it's clear that, you know, the strength of smart diversity rests on the, the strength of the model itself then um, in terms of actually being accurate there. And I know that you've been doing a lot of work on um, kind of digging in this season to um, test that accuracy. And um, can you talk a little bit maybe about um, some possible biases we've uncovered in the, in the past and um, what that looks like and what our, our manual review process looks like for finding those? Yeah, so, you know, a big reason we wanted to jump on this session today is to really talk, you know, Will and I have been working really closely over the past, um, you know, this whole season really, and, and before the season on improving the MLB model. And I, one of the main reasons kind of coming into the season that, um, one issue I would say, or or bias that I wanted to address was how we handled minor leaguers. So for you know many years we've included this minor league data into our model, but I think often I've noticed and in um, some analysis I've noticed that we were not really accounting for minor league statistics in like the best way. So sometimes sometimes we would overrate players that had really really excellent minor league numbers, or we would underrate players that had really bad minor league numbers. Um, and I think it's the reason is because it's very difficult to um, make that comparison when a player gets from the minors to the majors, because when they're in the minors, they're mostly just facing minor league pitchers that we don't really know how good their uh, opposition awe is. We only know their stats in the minors. Um, so what I really wanted to do was kind of work on a better way of translating minor league statistics to the majors and it's not as simple as just taking their minor league stats and saying all right let's like multiply it by 0.9 and that's our new stats because the way the model works is it's taking all of this play-by-play -play data and it's going one play at a time through every single game these tens of thousands of games maybe hundreds of thousands um so you know will and i really worked a lot on talking high level theoretical about how to fix this bias of, um, of, you know, kind of overrating good minor leaguers, underrating bad minor leaguers. And um, Will can talk a little bit uh, more about how we did this, but that was sort of the bias that we found and we wanted to address. Um, the other thing kind of separate from that is just for, for the past few years before this year, pretty much everything about Saber Sim was automated and there was very little manual input into the model. And that's what I, that's what we wanted. That's what I intended because whenever you add a manual um, 
intervention, there's the possibility of adding your own personal bias, right? And adjusting things when they shouldn't be adjusted. But one thing that we're doing a lot differently is we're trying to identify spots where, okay, the model isn't perfect, no model is perfect, um, but so it's going to have some biases and we want to identify those and make those adjustments so that we're getting the most accurate results, but we're doing it in an objective way. So we know like, hey, this park moved their fences back 10 feet this year. We're going to apply like a park adjustment or we know that the ball, you know, the pitcher, um, the sticky substances ban is now going to be affecting strikeout rates. We're going to apply an adjustment to the model to account for that because that's not something that any model is really going to be able to do on its own. So we're, and then stuff like um, pitch counts where a pitcher might be coming back from injuries on a pitch limit. We're doing a lot of more of that little manual intervention that's still based on objective data, but it's really improving the sim where the model isn't necessarily perfect. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe Will can talk more about, you know, in terms of like the minor league stuff that I was talking about and um, more of the specifics of how we improve the model based on that. Yeah. So our biggest challenge was like Matt said, of basically, how do you take you know, a minor leaker who, you know, has a really great, you know, home run rate in the, in AAA or something like that. And how do you adjust that for them facing better pitchers, but also pitchers that are throwing harder and, you know, you know, different parks and, you know, like how the fences are different or fences are closer or further back and everything like that. So our approach ultimately kind of came down to, um, you know, analyzing how the leagues have interacted before. So how players that have you know, both double A AA and triple A experience and how they've shifted their, like how their stats have adjusted throughout there um, and figuring out basically how we can project um, and how we can adjust each of those stats to a different league. So, you know, if we have um, a double A prospect, we can say, we can, you know, confidently and maybe not confidently, we can estimate what his stats would look like in triple A. Um, and if we can do that, then we can estimate what his stats look like in the major leagues. And so we have basically all of these different things. You know, Clayton Kershaw and Double A would be unhittable. Um, but you know, like who is the uh, Wander Franco who just came up? Um, we might have been a little bit more bearish on him than others might have been just looking just at their minor league stats because there's an adjustment. There's you know more home runs hit in the major leagues, uh, but you know the contact rate is going to decrease for you know, batters that are coming up from uh, a league where they're facing worse pitchers. Um, and their strikeout rate is probably going to increase because they're, you know, facing harder to hit stuff. Um, so that's the bulk of what we did. We tested a lot of different methods and I'm really happy with not only the implementation that we have, but also the results that it's done. Yeah. Speaking on, on those results, I know we're not really just applying these fixes and waiting for uh, future results to come in or, or looking just at anecdotal um, data, we're actually doing some some rigorous back testing here uh, to test our, our findings. Do you want to talk a little bit about what, what that looks like? Uh, Matt, do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah. So um, basically, we just really last night and like this morning, um, we kind of finished up a really big round of improvements. Um, we're just doing some like last tinkers on the model. Not that this is like the final thing, we're still working on stuff, but um, we pushed out kind of a new version of the model a couple of days ago. And then yeah, last night and this morning, we ran basically a back test of this entire season. So we re-simulated every single game of the season using like the updated model improvements that we've been talking about. And so then we just did some results on comparing our game projections to um, Vegas lines. And it's pretty remarkable improvement. Uh, so like before with kind of the current simulations, we were actually slightly negative um, comparing like our closing line money line performance to Vegas, which honestly is like, that's kind of expected, right? So Vegas closing lines are basically as accurate as you get in terms of um predicting the outcome of a game it's very difficult to be more accurate than closing lines because they're accounting for all of these really sharp betters that are putting money on these lines so um being like slightly negative i think is is fine and i'm not actually i wouldn't have been worried about that but we re-ran all of these sims and we're now like way way up uh, looking at 
um, our game projections versus closing lines, which is amazing. It's like um, just really, really uh, thrilling. <laughs> I think like we saw these results and we were like, Will and I were um, kind of our jaws dropped. So uh, it's really cool. We're still kind of running some more analysis, not just on money line, but on um, the total bets on run line bets. And then we're going to really look into like individual statistics and kind of look at, do we still have any biases? Are we, you know, it seems like we still kind of have a bias towards the under for a lot of games. And um, so we're going to look into, well, are, do we need to adjust certain statistics to get a little bit closer to the total and not be under, but there also might be a legitimate reason to be under. I think, um, you know, I, I know I've talked to Andy, our CEO, about this before, but there's actually just a bias in general for the lines that um, unders tend to be better bets than overs overall because people like betting overs. And so um, more money tends to be on the overs despite them. So that kind of moves the lines up a little bit. So I think there's a little bit of a natural um, edge in betting unders. We might still be a little bit too far under. So we're still kind of continually looking at the results, but um, even so, you know, we're way up on even under bets, on over bets, on money line. It, like all of these back tests are looking amazing based on all of these improvements we've done. Yeah, that's awesome. I know we had Max here on the show for our first strategy session, actually, where we were talking about sports betting and, and he mentioned, um, the same thing with, with, uh, betting unders and how he found that those were some of his, his, um, best bets overall in baseball in particular. So. Um, I am interested. I know you had mentioned uh, about this manual review process um, and, you know, how when you first started putting together SaberSim that you wanted to avoid manual intervention to avoid personal biases from leaking in. Can you maybe expand a little bit on what the manual review process is looking like and um, how we're avoiding kind of leaking some of that personal bias in or what, what kind of things are we using for, for indicators that maybe something does need a little bit of intervention? Yeah, so the, the main things that we're looking at right now for that manual intervention. So first thing is pitch counts. Um, so what we're doing now is we're kind of taking the pitch counts in the sim, like in the morning runs of the sims, and we're comparing that to um, basically like the industry and then um, just looking for places where we're um, like our pitch counts are off from um, the rest of the industry or off from like uh, prop bets. So we'll look at um, a lot of sports books have prop bets for like number of outs recorded. And that's a good sense of the like innings pitch for pitchers. And not that we want to be exactly matching Vegas props because they're pretty inefficient, but if there's a really big difference, then that's something where we can look into pitcher game logs and see, looks like this pitcher, you know, hasn't gone in over a month, he's coming back from an injury. We might look into a beat writer article that says, hey, this this pitcher threw 50 pitches in their last rehab outing. Um, that's not something that's gonna be easily available statistically. You kind of have to have a little bit of a manual review um, that just looks at those pitchers and says, this is somebody that's not gonna go as long as, as it says, or on the other side of things, um, maybe last time the pitcher was just coming back from injury, but now they're fully stretched out and we wanna, bump up their pitch count because we know maybe the manager said, Hey, they're good to go. They're going to, we're, they're not, not, not on a limit. So um, the pitch count thing is really big. I think, especially for the DFS projections, that's going to really help the accuracy of that. Um, it'll help with the betting as well, but with the projections, it'll really just dial those in. Uh, the other thing is just looking at like Vegas lines and, um, kind of seeing where our projections differ from Vegas and not just that, but how Vegas is moving. So, you know, a really good indicator of, um, of like edge, I guess, in a line is which direction the line is moving. Um, so if, you know, the, the money line for a team starts at like minus 150 and then later in the day it moves to like, minus 120 that probably means that there's a lot of like sharp money on the other side of that bet and so if we're moving in the opposite direction 
of how the line is moving, that generally means, hey, maybe we're like missing something about this game. Maybe there's some key injury for a player or, you know, a pitcher is, um, you know, his velocity has dropped a lot or there's like this sticky substances thing where he's actually expected to be perform worse or there's just some factor that we're missing because the sim and the models are not perfect. Um, we're going to miss something sometimes. And so having that um, indicator that's like, hey, maybe there's something off here and we can kind of make some adjustments to account for that is that's how how that uh, part of it works. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And and the goal here ultimately is that we are providing projections um, that are as accurate as possible as the user um, when you're building your DFS lineups. But I guess in the... While we're thinking about this kinds of things, speaking as a, you know a Saversim user, are there opportunities that I could do a little bit of this on my own, or possibly use some of these signals on my own to add some value uh, to my DFS process? Yeah, Will, you want to take that one? Yeah. So I mean, there's basically uh, like Matt. Matt's covered most of like the events that would trigger us to manually intervene on them, and so I think most of the time it's just we're going to basically in those situations usually just move towards vegas like that's typically you know if if we're unsure we just we know that this is likely a result of like you know decreasing striker pitch out rate or pitcher strikeout rates or, or something to that effect um and so if you disagree with that assumption um or something to that effect i think that's a great place to like impact that so specifically like uh, I remember the Giants changed their park recently. And so if you have a different view on how that affects, you know, maybe certain handed batters, you know, so it's like if, you know, we may apply like a global home run uh, decrease there or increase there, um, but you may want to only, you may want to like boost right handed batters or something to that effect where you might be able to dial in more um, if you have sort of a differing view than we do there. Gotcha. And assuming I was, you know, tackling a, a slate maybe it's a big uh 14 or 15 game slate and i only have so much time uh to prepare and research for the slate are there indicators that i could use to pick certain games or teams that maybe require a little bit of extra research would it be like separation from vegas or would you look more at the trends of the way the lines have moved or um how would you recommend somebody go about finding maybe uh, a couple different spots to to make some changes on a on a big slate Matt, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely tough uh, when you have a huge slate because there's so many teams and so many pitchers that you don't want to spend all day. And really, I mean, what we're all the stuff that we're talking about is like we're doing that work for you. Right. So I want to start off with to be clear that like you don't have to do that research. You can use the work that we're putting in, mm -hmm. and like you'll have good results um that said yeah there are ways that you can add value um you know i think one thing yes yeah, looking at the spots where we differ from vegas or especially where uh you know you notice that the line has really moved in one direction and if that direction is kind of farther if we're in the opposite direction so if, say the line has moved way towards um you know the red sox and we are our uh, team total for the Red Sox is way under the implied. Um, you know, maybe something is we're missing there and we didn't pick it up in our manual intervention or maybe we decided, hey, actually, I think we're right here. But you might think, hey, Vegas is probably right. So you can kind of um, adjust the team totals on the main page to get closer to what Vegas is. Um, in terms of like pitchers, I think one way that you can really find some differentiation and find some edge is looking at some more detailed like stat cast data, looking at pitchers that have maybe added new pitches or their velocity has changed a lot, or maybe their spin rate, you know, with someone like Garrett Cole, where it's like, oh, his spin rate's a lot lower without um, using the, the uh, spider tack or whatever it's called. Um, maybe that's someone to target, you know, to stack against for like a contrarian play. I think there's lots of stuff like that, that we're doing our best to account for that kind of thing, but there's always room to add to the model by looking at those detailed stats. I wouldn't look big picture at like, oh, well, this guy has a 
high ERA or this batter, you know, makes a lot of contact or he's hit a lot of home runs recently, because that's something that like the model is really good at doing objectively. And like, I, I'm not going to be able to add value there as much as anybody else, just, you know, just like anybody else, because I'm not a computer. Um, I, I, you know, built Saber Sim a long time ago and Will's like added a ton of value to it. And it's like this very complex algorithm and the things that it does account for, it does really, really well. But when there's other uh, factors that might not be part of that model, um, I think that's something where you can add some value. But yeah, I mean, on a big slate, maybe you just, you take a look at a few pitchers where you know that something might be up or you look at a few teams where there's a big difference in you try to add some value there. You don't have to go through every single player on the slate or every single team on the slate. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think overall, it's it's kind of reassuring to know that this manual review or or at least a second look is, is taking place here um, for these things that are outside of the control of the the simulator itself. So um, definitely good to know that that you know one level of review here is kind of already taking place. Uh, anytime you open up the app and pull up a slate that day, so. Um, but there's definitely some some additional value that you can find there. I think there are some some questions that have rolled in here now that we maybe can get to. I think this one came in, um, Matt, when you were kind of talking about your your high level overview here. Um, this came in from Ateru on Slack, and he asked, "Are your simulations pitcher based or batter based?" The problem with creating an event, for instance, a strikeout pitch, is both the pitcher and specific hitter probably influence the probability of this pitching outcome. Um, I know kind of maybe getting in a little bit deeper into the details here, but yeah, I mean, looking at a pitcher that has their own strikeout rates and a hitter that has their own strikeout rates, how are we going about kind of parsing that and and coming up with probabilities? Yeah, that's a really good question. And a very, it's, it's not a simple problem to solve, um, especially because it's not just pitcher and batter, right? Uh, those are not the only two factors when you're determining like, what's the probability of this of this um, plate appearance ending in a strikeout. You have the pitcher and the batter, you have the umpire, you have um, how hot is it out at what is the, which park are they in? Um, you have, you know, what does the wind look like? What's what's the temperature? Well, I already said temperature, but there's all these different factors, right? That influence how the event happens. So it's not pitcher based or batter based. Um, what we do is we just have a formula that takes in all of these different factors. It can take, between one and you know unlimited really number of factors and they all have their own probabilities of this event occurring and those probabilities are based on um, all of this uh, past data and how high variance the stat is so you know some factors are going to be very stable where it's like we know that this is the probability for this certain uh, factor for other ones we don't really know so it'll be really regressed towards the mean but we take all those factors and we basically just plug it into this formula and it outputs the probability that this event will occur based on all of those factors and like the league average. So uh, the simple answer is it's not pitcher or batter based. It's, it's based on all of the factors that go into the game and into a specific plate appearance. Um, and so that's where, I mean, I think that's what makes it so powerful is that it's not just any one thing and you can't really get to the same conclusion just by looking with your eyes because there's just so many different stats that go into it. Yeah, that's, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I mean, when you're watching the baseball game, literally with your eyes, exactly as you said, you think you're watching this binary relationship between the pitcher and the batter and who's going to win. In reality, we have all these other factors that are, that are coming into play and, and we're taking into account, which I think is really a lot of the strength of, of the model and, and part of what makes it so cool here. Um, I did see another question here that came in also from Ateru, and this is an interesting one. Um, he asked, uh, can we backtest the new simulation model within the client ourselves for previous slates, or is the new model only applied to upcoming events? I, I, I'm actually genuinely curious about that too. If, if you were to go back to a previous slate just for review and, and simulate it and build lineups, are you using our new model, or is it retroactively? So it, yeah, it, it, it is using the old model so we didn't overwrite the results uh and the reason is just we don't want to mess with previous builds with if you do a build on a previous slate using specific projections we don't want to overwrite those and make it seem like we're you know changing our projections after the fact so 
uh, I think it's just, you know, we, we don't want to, to change the projections and seem kind of sketchy that way. Uh, so it's only on upcoming slates. Um, we have run the back test for all the previous sims. They're just not live on the site. But, uh, you know, there this is live right now. This is the projections for tonight are using the new model. And really, we've been using, um, it's not like this is one like new and improved model that we suddenly put into place. We've been iterating and improving on this for the past you know, few weeks or really just throughout the entire season. But I think especially the past few weeks, we've really made the big gains. And so really today is just when we finish like this full back test, but the model has been improving and we've been seeing a lot of those those changes throughout the past, you know, week or two especially. Gotcha. Yeah. And and definitely want to stress that this is a hundred percent an iterative thing, right? This isn't mm -hmm. um, just you know, our one big splash here where the model is um, what it is. We want to continue to to improve on this over time. You mentioned here at the start that we uh, are looking at maybe a potential minor under bias here. Are there any other things that we're looking at um, for some possible uh, near future improvements as we continue to get a little bit better here? Yeah, Will, you want to talk about the uh, decay rate stuff a little bit? Because I think that's one area that we've been working on. Yeah. Through. So the the couple of things that we're we're really focused on, like currently after this big update of of minor league adjustments, um, is the decay rate first of all, which is basically like how strongly are we going to rate weight recent stats versus their historical stats? So you know if a batter has been in the league for ten years, how much do we want to weight their ten year sample size versus how much do we want to weight their last like their last year or their last couple of weeks? Um, and so that's like a problem that isn't just you know there's no answer to that. Um, so that's just something that we have to explore, test, and um, improve on. And I think some of the other things that we're doing is, is looking at like any park-specific biases as well is another uh, route that we're looking to improve on and see, you know, if there's, you know, something that we're missing. I think a big part of that could just be with parks changing. Um, and so analyzing, you know, both recent and, his, and like long, long-term historical performances, how can we, you know, improve our accuracy there. Gotcha. And and when is the big uh, BVP update coming in to start incorporating that heavily? Uh, never. Oh, OK. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Um, let's see. I see another question came in from Andrew here on YouTube. Um, he asked, when the score of a team is six, is Smart Diversity optimizing to find the best lineup that achieves that specific score while simultaneously finding the best co-stack. And then he followed that up by saying, I'm mostly wondering if a team score caps the focus of games Smart Diversity pulls from at the 9 or 10 setting. I don't want to completely disregard outlier games where a team goes off. Um, yeah, I, I can. Oh, do, you, do you want to answer that, Well, Yeah, it sounds like Graham is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <making I, presence. laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so basically when you adjust, I, I think what you're saying is that adjusting a team total, like setting it to uh, six. Um, yeah, so that's not going to remove the outliers of smart diversity. Um, what it's going to do is essentially sort of shift the mean of your distribution. So, you know, if we were projecting the team as a mean of five runs and you uh, set it to six, you essentially shift the distribution more to the right, but you won't completely get rid of the outliers. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, and that's that's a good question. That's that's one that I was I was curious about too. So great question, Andrew. Um, let's see. Uh, I saw another question come in here. I don't know if this is is, is uniquely related to the model here. Um, Giant Cobra asked uh, one question. I have: Can we add DK and FanDuel contest to see who took down the contests in the game centers? Maybe a, a uh, future feature I there. I think we're we're thinking about that. I think it it's not going to be anytime soon, but we're definitely looking at ways to add a little bit more review of specific contests rather than just looking at your lineups. Kind of looking at well, how do my lineups do in this contest? We see do some analysis of you know actual contest results, but um, it would probably be pretty far off. But we're definitely it's in our minds. <laughs> gotcha. 
Yeah, I, I guess another question I have here too, I, I don't see any others from our users here in, in YouTube or Slack for the time being. So if you guys have questions, feel free to fire them off. But I mean, an interesting question I have is we're obviously very focused around baseball right now. It's right in the middle of baseball season. Um, but as we start to look forward to football and NBA coming back in the fall, uh, what have you guys kind of learned throughout this process here in the past couple months? Are there some lessons that we've learned that maybe could be applied to other sports and, and improve the product overall or um, following baseball? Like what are, what are some things that we want to take from this and apply to, to our football model and our basketball model and so on? Yeah. I mean, I'll let Will answer it after me if he has any thoughts there, but you know, one cool thing is that the, all of the other sports use very similar um, models as baseball does in terms of how that works. So we're, for all of the different sports, we're taking all of this like play-by-play -play data from all of, you know, the, the different leagues and we're taking it from, you know, the past 10 years or however long we have and, uh, and putting it into this model where we come up with the probabilities and then sticking that into a simulator. So a lot of the lessons we've learned will directly apply. So if we have football stats from, you know, right now we're not accounting for, you know, we're not really pulling in much college stats, but we definitely, you know, the, those stats are available. We could pull those in and use similar um, methodology as we do for the minor league stats for football. Um, and even just stuff like the decay rate that Will was talking about, where we're talk looking at how do we incorporate recent stats versus historical stats. Um, a lot of those lessons and a lot of the stuff that we've been improving on in baseball is totally directly applicable because all of the models kind of are using a very similar methodology. There's def obviously differences because the sports are so different, but the kind of high level way that they work is very similar. Yeah, I, I'm definitely excited to take a look at, you know, trying to control for college football and, you know, new drafts and, you know, lots of, lots of very cool things in my mind about that, um, that I'd love to dig into. Um, yeah, I, I think a big part of what we've done really in like, specifically in the last couple of weeks with like this final push to get like this back test going and everything like that is we've really sort of like deconstructed the the whole model and put it back together like we've just completely like you know taken it apart looked at all the pieces figured it all out so i think that like we're, we're like in a really good place to like make improvements on it and we know like exactly uh, at least for me you know I'm still kind of new uh, like really figuring out how it all, you know, works together in my head and everything like that. So I know it's like, if I want to, you know, control for this or isolate these, you know, it's, it's all, um, all really interesting stuff that I think directly applies to the other models. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, it's been awesome hearing about the work you guys have been doing on baseball recently. And I, I can't wait to see how it translates into to some of the other sports um, another, another question I, I had that I wanted to talk about, you know, a user pulls up, uh, the SaberSim app and they, they see not just, uh, one set of projections, but two in the form of ownership. Um, can, can either of you guys talk a little bit about what that, um, ownership model looks like, um, how those numbers are, are being generated, uh, and maybe even some, um, ideas for what we have going on behind the scenes for improvement there. Yeah, so ownership is really cool, and I think uh, different than a lot of how a lot of places do it. So our ownership projections are actually um, using a simulator as well. Uh, in a way, it's not the play-by-play -play sports simulator, but what we do is we take um, our projections and then other factors um, from you know just the industry. Um, we take our projections and all these other factors, and we essentially simulate the contests. Um, so we'll simulate kind of a big GPP contest using these projections and build actual lineups. And the ownership projections are essentially just the exposures of this simulated contest. So we'll build thousands of lineups and then look at, okay, what is each player owned in these lineups that we build? And that's what the ownership projections are. And so one, it's nice because you get ownership projections that they all add up to the right amount um, and they make sense with each other. If they're, we're looking at the actual like lineup construction. So if there's a position where there's only like two viable players or there's like a really expensive um, pitcher on the slate that everybody's going to play, that means the rest of the batters that are expensive might be lower owned. We're going to kind of account for all of that because we're making actual lineups. Um, 
but there's really a lot to improve upon there. So there's way more factors that we can um, incorporate into the owner ownership projections. We're still doing it fairly um, simply because I think it works pretty well, but there's a lot of different other factors that we can pull in and kind of incorporate into that same process where we're simulating the contest essentially. Um, yeah, and then I, I don't know if you specifically said like what users can do to add to them, but I'll just touch on that as well. I think, you know, one thing is looking at because our actual projections are kind of part of what go into ownership, uh, because we think, you know, we have really good projections that, that kind of mirror a lot of what the industry, you know, when we project a player really high, it's likely that other people are going to see that as well. And other projection sources are going to be similar. But if there's somewhere where you think that we're off, um, we may be over projecting ownership in uh, areas where we're way higher on a team or a player than the rest, you know, than other sources are. So one, you know, source of values, you can maybe increase ownership where we're really low on a team or a pitcher compared to the field and vice versa if we're really high. Um, and just when there's kind of this hype factor that is maybe beyond projections where someone like Wander Franco, who he's min price batting second, and it's like the top prospect of the past five years. Well, not, I'm ignoring Vlad, but, um, you know, he's a very top prospect, expected to do very well. I think we had him below 10% projected ownership. Other sources um, that I was looking at also had him below 10%. He came in at like 22 and that's a place where it was pretty obvious, I think, if you looked at it, like, hey, this guy's going to be owned because he's known, he's this hyped prospect, and people are going to want to play him. So, you know, that's definitely a way to add value where you can say, hey, I, I think, I mean, hopefully you didn't increase his ownership because he ended up doing really well, and then you would have had less of him at the higher ownership. But, you know, um, that's a good place to add value. Where I think intuition actually can play a stronger role in ownership projections than they than it should in normal projections because when you're doing ownership you really you're predicting what other people are going to do and just using intuition about that i think can often just based on experience of like hey i've played dfs before i've seen these contests i think this guy is going to be high owned for me i think that often ends up helping um just based on like hey i know what other people are going to do based on my experience yeah, I think that's a big part of it where it's a, a double-edged sword in that predicting human behavior is harder for a model but easier for a human because it's it's exactly like you said. I mean, like, if I go to play a contest and it's like I look at, you know, the prospect that I've seen 47 articles written about on Twitter, um, I know he's probably going to get some ownership just from virtue of people hand-building or people that just – you know, he's been touted, people want to have him in their lineups, then uh, I'll just go ahead and increase his owner per ownership percentage. And that's just something that, you know, an automated model probably won't get uh, without incorporating like a ton more factors. Yeah, it's almost as if like the ownership model is trying to estimate what people should do given the inputs um, and rather than what they actually will do. I see, I mean, pretty often I think ownership condenses a little bit more than than the model might expect. But I mean, the way it is set up right now, part of what makes it really cool and, and really useful, at least for me, is that because we're doing this dynamically and actually creating real lineups, we have ownership projections for um, smaller slates, things like turbos and night slates and showdowns um, in a way that actually mimics the way people are going to have to build lineups for that contest. Um, where maybe some other models that are out there, are, there's a heavy manual component to that and they can't possibly have ownership projections for all those different slates and um, contest types and things like that. So, yeah, I would say that there's probably, I don't play too many of those really small slates, but I would guess that there's a lot more edge in using those ownership projections for those like um, smaller turbo night slates because they're not as readily available elsewhere. And we're really mimicking, like you said, we're kind of mimicking how people actually have to build those lineups. So I bet you can kind of, yeah, get more, even more value out of the ownership projections, um, looking at them for those smaller slates. Yeah, it, it's been working out for me. I, I Those are some of my best contests nice. is some of those other smaller slates. So um, let's see, uh, another question came in here through YouTube. Um, says, I'm, I'm still not sure how I can add value to the model 
um, that's not already being considered in the model. And, and this is kind of like the question that comes in um, like almost every day here on office hours. And um, Nancy Drew guy, I don't, I don't know if you're joined in here um, a little later or, or just caught some of that, that beginning section. We did talk about this in a little bit more detail, but really just maybe for like a quick and dirty um, answer to this. Right. Uh, and, and um, I, I don't know what the right word is here as, as, uh, as not mathematical as possible. Um, what's one thing maybe you guys would both say that somebody can do that can step in where they've only got limited time and impact uh, their lineups in a way that is positive EV for that for that slate? Yeah, I think for me, um, it would just be comparing our run totals to implied run totals on Vegas or taking a look at the betting page and seeing what teams we have you know strong unit bets on. Um, and if it feels wrong, or, you know, if I, I just, I don't want that much exposure to a team, just bringing their run total closer to Vegas. There's, there's nothing like a stand doesn't need to be a hundred percent or zero percent on a player or a team. There's really nothing wrong with going just a bit over or a bit under a team that's still taking a stand that's still generating, you know, a difference. Um, so I think that's the, the, if I was just going in there with five minutes before a build, that's where I would go to. Yeah, um, you know, for me, I think what I mentioned before was getting into like the stat cast data, stuff like that. I think while that's true that you can add value there, um, it is hard for someone that is new to this or doesn't really know how to interpret that sort of data. And honestly, I don't really do much of that myself. I really trust the model a lot and I essentially use what it tells me. Um, I will say like how I, this isn't exactly, um, adding input into the model itself. But where I add my most manual intervention is in like the step three exposures uh, page after the build runs, where I'm looking at where my highest exposures are, both in individual players and in team stacks. Um, and I'm kind of adjusting those partly based on intuition, um, where I'm, I just see, if I see a player that's really high, especially if they're way higher than the ownership projection, I might want to, um, sometimes I want to just take a stand there. Other times I think, you know, I can get a lot of leverage out of playing 50% of a 10% owned player without having to have a hundred percent of them. Um, other times I just want to diversify my stacks a little bit. Um, or I look and I see a play that, that looks, you know, a team or a pitcher that looks, um, I have less exposure to than I want that maybe, you know, it's someone like, say like uh, Fernando Tatis against Trevor Bauer last night, where if you're just running a build, you might not get much of him because he'll be low projected because he's going against a top tier pitcher. But I might look at my exposure, see I have, maybe I have 2% of him and think he's got really high upside, especially if I'm going to be fading Trevor Bauer or if I'm going to be having less of that pitcher than I want, I'll try to bump up like maybe a star player that goes against them because, um, you know, I'm trying to take advantage of the leverage from fading that pitcher or something like that. So long story short, I think that I'm adding a lot of my value and my manual intervention really in managing my exposures after the fact, rather than necessarily altering projections beforehand. And I know that's different than what, you know, Max and Danny Steinberg um, have talked a lot about adjusting their projections beforehand and so there's a lot of different ways to add your own input but that's just the way that i prefer to do it or how i intend to do it yeah i do a lot of my work on the exposures too rather than the projections as well so um yeah. these questions are, are always kind of tough because uh, you know a lot of it's just going to hinge so much on a slate to slate basis so i mean i guess the last thing to just kind of wrap this up is you mentioned it earlier matt i mean I, we, we don't want to give the indication that anyone should be uh hitting the app on any day pulling up the slate and feeling like they must make a change uh to be effective right we're already putting a lot of time and and our own review process into these um there are opportunities to add value at times, especially on different slates or, or certain situations, but no one should feel like they need to go in and start moving numbers around to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there was some interest here in that conversation about ownership. We had a couple questions trickle in here, so I'm gonna pull some of these in. Um, this was another question from Slack here. 
Uh, is there a chance that Saberson could determine ownership projections for different entry fees in the future? I know this question uh, does come in sometimes. It, it also, uh, we hear this question in the form of, could you project uh, single entry ownership versus 150 max ownership or, or cash games ownership versus GPP ownership? Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a few thoughts on this too, but any anything that you guys uh, want to mention here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good idea. I think it would be a cool new addition to ownership and like i we i you know we have a lot of cool features that we're working on right now so that's probably not something that we're going to be able to do in the coming like months or weeks but like i think i would love to have different ownership projections for different size contests and different entry fee contests so that you're really able to differentiate um but yeah i mean in the meantime like feel free to change the ownership projections as well um based on the type of contest that you're entering um you know and like the high stakes you know 100 man contests or whatever that there's just going to be way more concentrated ownership um whereas i think our ownership projections probably lean towards more of the low stakes big contests where they're not quite as sharp as like the bigger ones uh, because they're a little bit more spread out than sometimes those big uh contests tend to be so yeah, long story short, we should absolutely do that. And I I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I, I was going to echo kind of what you just said. I, I think particularly, I, I know less maybe about this question from the, the form of like an entry fee standpoint, but um, we do talk in office hours pretty often for people that are playing single entry or three max or things like that. You see a lot of that ownership condense on what the field perceives uh, to be the best plays on any given slate. Um, I always recommend, you know, if, you, if you're if you a single entry player and you play a lot of single entry and you're familiar with how ownership kind of condenses, um, that's definitely a spot you can add value by just making adjustments uh, to the ownership model because yeah I, I think we are kind of mimicking a a large field wide gpp um with ownership getting pretty spread out so um let's see another question here came in pull this up this is an ownership question as well uh since the ownership model is based on a slate slim sim and the builder wait but since the ownership model is based on a slate sim does the builder function as a slate sim or does it only build based on the outcomes of the games and ignore the potential contests the lineups are being played in? I think I know the answer, but just wanted to ask. Yeah, so the the builder uh, just, well, it, it's a little bit complicated to answer, right? If you have ownership fade at zero, so you're not incorporating ownership at all, then it is just looking at the outcomes of the games and is not accounting for ownership at all. If you have the ownership slider on, we are trying to mimic. I would say that like what we're trying to do is similar to mimicking a slate sim where we're trying to find we're trying to build lineups that have the highest um, expected value given that they're being played in these tournament structures, right? So the entire point of accounting for ownership and fading high owned players and boosting low owned players, all that stuff that, that the ownership fader slider does. Um, the whole point of that is to build lineups that have a better chance of being in the top 1%, the top 0.1% of a contest. Um, we're not literally doing a slate sim where we're, um, we're trying to find the lineups that like actually place the best in the slate just because it's very, very resource intensive. Um, you know, I think Will and I have both like looked at that on our, on our kind of personal use of like how can we analyze this contest? How can we find lineups that that have the highest likelihood of placing well in in contests? Um, but it's been more of like an analytic um, thing, but not really something that's that's possible to incorporate into the builder just in terms of how much processing power it would take to like. We have to build all these contest lineups, which we can kind of do with the ownership, but then we have to simulate all of them and rank them and then decide how do our lineups place within these lineups. Um, so it's just, it's a very complicated problem. And I think the purpose of the ownership fate slider is to solve that problem in a faster, simpler way, um, if that makes sense. So really like 
that's what we're trying to do is essentially build lineups in a way that mimic the results of what a slate or contest simulator would do. Yeah, and and I want to add to that that like the default settings like for each of those like tournament like if you input what kind of tournament you're playing uh, and how those like generating those are generated from an analysis of you know simming a contest like that and looking at sort of what level of ownership is required like or you know is typical or you know how much upside do we need to try and capture and so like that's a really good point yeah yeah so it's like we're you know. I can run a slate sim and I'll get back to you in nine hours when it finishes about, you know, what the actual optimals are. Um, whereas like this can, you know, build, it, you know, all the lineups in like, you know, one or two minutes and gets you like almost all the way there. Um, so that's, yeah. Uh, that's to, to expand on that, like we've actually done, like, I think, well, you kind of mentioned, but we've literally done back tests. Like we, we created these defaults by running like hours and hours you know, one of our, um, yeah, one of our developers literally like would kick this off every single night. It would run all night and it would be testing every single possible combination of slider settings on all of these different contests and came up with like these defaults that are back tested um, as like kind of the highest EV. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily always perfect for every single contest and we're still working iterating those and they still depend on what the field is doing if the field changes and everybody starts not stacking or everybody starts 100 percent stacking things are going to change um and if people start playing way more of the chalky players things are going to change so it always changes but yeah i do want to clarify like the defaults are created from that sort of slate sim it's just the lineup builder itself is not a slate sim or a contest sim yeah yeah that's it that's a great point. That's really interesting. It's a great question too. Thank you for asking that. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see a another question here. Getting close to the end here. Another feature request. It looks like can you all can you all please add a study lineup to see how the top players construct their lineup? Um, definitely another a feature I've gotten requested here on uh, on office hours before of kind of um, maybe a review of of past slates. I can definitely see how that would be useful. Any? Do you guys have any thoughts there? I mean, I think I mentioned this already earlier. Somebody asked something similar. That's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, I I would caution you just in, like from a theoretical perspective, it can be dangerous to um, you have you can run into like small sample size issues where you're studying like a single slate or even like a week of slates, um, and you see, hey, this this player did really well. They won a hundred thousand dollars. They won a million dollars by playing these players and playing these stack constructions. And uh, there's a lot of danger in kind of overfitting and, and taking signal when uh, from, from these results when there's just noise. Uh, the other problem is that I think a lot of, especially, I mean, even pros have these heuristics that they use where they're going to always set five, three stacks, or they're always going to, to like, um, you know, play batters that are next to each other in the batting order. And a lot of the reason that they do this is because they don't have the tools that do it for them. Like this is, these are heuristics that they know work and create winning lineups, but they're not like the necessarily optimal, perfect way of playing. And so I think you can get into dangerous territory of like, oh, I'm going to only play five, three stacks because that's what I see the pros doing when really it's, they're only doing that because like, that's the easiest way to kind of fit stacks into their optimizer um and it's not necessarily like the best lineups to be playing yeah that's a great point i i completely agree um i mean i think sometimes another question i get here on on the show sometimes is you know somebody runs a build and they say why am i not getting all five stacks um almost that the the heuristic or the the rule that exists because it's hard to account for correlation with a traditional optimizer has now become the de facto only way to play the contest. Mm -hmm. And now when given an optimizer that all, kind of takes into account correlation and ownership and upside dynamically and builds lineups um, on its own, it gets flipped on its head. Like, why isn't this doing the thing that is the heuristic? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. Um, I don't see any other 
questions rolling in here. We're getting close to the end of time. Thank you, everybody who uh, took the time to to watch this, either the folks watching live or everybody that's watching the recording back of this later. Uh, I will get this recording up this afternoon and we'll have it time stamped if you want to come back and review a certain question um, or anything like that again. Thank you, Matt and Will, for being on here today. Do either of you guys have any other final thoughts before we we hop off? Nothing else for me yet. Yeah. Nope. Thanks for having us. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Cool. Yeah. I'll be right back here tomorrow for office hours, 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll pick this right back up again next week on Thursday with another strategy session. If you guys have any thoughts at all of something that you think would be interesting for us to dive a little deeper into on a Thursday, always free, feel free to shout it out in Slack or in email, um, whatever works for you guys, and, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Catch you later.